Well, hello, hello, hello. My name is Felicia Davis, and I am so excited to be here with you today. And I know you are just as excited as I am because we are here to have an intimate conversation in Fireside Chat with Ms. Carla Harris. And um, I know that you all know who she is, but I just want to make sure I set the room up properly for her before we start our conversation. Carla Harris is a senior client advisor at Morgan Stanley. She was most recently as a vice chairman responsible for increasing client connectivity and penetration to enhance revenue generation across the firm. She formerly, she formerly headed the Emerging Manager Program, the equity capital markets effort for the consumer and retail industries, and was responsible for equity private placements. In her 30 plus year career, Ms. Harris has had extensive industry experiences in the, in the technology, media, retail, telecommunications, transportation, industrial, and healthcare sectors. In 2013, Carla Harris was appointed by President Barack Obama to chair the National Women's Business Council. Now, for more than a decade, Ms. Harris was a senior member of the equity syndicate desk and executed such transaction as initial public offerings for UPS, Martha Start Living Omnimedia, Ariba, Red Black, the General Motors Sub IPO and Delphi Automotive. And get this. 3.2 billion common stock transaction for Immunex Corporation, one of the largest biotechnology common stock transactions in US history. Ms. Harris was named to Fortune Magazine's list of the 50 most powerful black executives in corporate America. Fortune's most influential list, US bankers top 25 most powerful women in finance in 2009, 2010, and 2011. Black Enterprises, top 75 most powerful women in business, and the top 75 Africans on Wall Street, as well as to Essence Magazine's list of the 50 women who are shaping the world, Ebony's list of Power 100, and 15 corporate women are at the top, and was named Woman of the Year by a Harvard Black Men Forum in 2011 and by the Yale Black, Yale Black Men's Forum. So she's crossing everything around this camp. Now, prior to joining Morgan Stanley, Carla received an MBA, second year honors from Harvard Business School and an AD in economics from Harvard University, magna cum laude. Carla also received honorary doctorates of laws from humanities, uh, laws, humanities, and business from Marymount Manhattan College, Bloomfield College, Converse College, Jackson University, Simons College, the College of New Rochelle, St. Thomas Aquinas College, Bab Babson College, Fisk University, Wake Forest University, and Felician University, respectively. She is also an international renowned public speaker and the author of the book, Strategize to Win, and, and of Expect to Win and her soon to be released new book, Lead to Win. Now, if that's not enough to get your attention, to get you to lean all the way into this conversation and take some notes, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my personal experience with Carla, which was at the launch of Take the Lead's uh, launch event many years ago. And um, I, was, I was scheduled to be an assistant to, to Miss Carla. Now, let me tell you, she's so bad to the bone that she didn't need my assistance at all. But I took full advantage of that time with her. And for the full day, I quietly, studiously asked her lots of different questions about her career, her book. And let me tell you, she put such a fire up under me that within 20 days of having that conversation with her, a book that I had been sitting on for years, I released that bad boy in 20 days. So let me, let me tell y'all, get ready, have pen and paper ready to go. And um, let's let's get this thing going. So Carla, 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 it's so good to be here with you today. How are you, my sister? I'm good, Miss Felicia, and it is good to be here with you. Yes, 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 yes. I'm so excited. So today, our conversation is focused around the big read. And 
I know for a fact that you are in the midst of your own big week because I've seen you on social media a lot. And when I saw you show up on TikTok, that was a big indication that Carla is in the midst of her own big week. So what is, you know, talking about the theme of what we're, our conversation today, what is your big week? Well, you know, I tell you, I, I really want to make sure that I'm helping people get to their thing, whatever that thing happens to be. And, you know, as you know, we met, I think it was 2014 was the first Take the Lead. And mm -hmm. I was out there then trying to talk about the pearls because I had learned so much. Right. And now I realize even eight years later that there's still a lot of professionals out there that are trying to achieve a level of success, but they don't have a playbook. So my thing is to, how can I amplify my efforts in making sure that I give people the tools that they need in order to get theirs, however they define theirs. And so as you have been like really stepping up and doing, being more visible across all the spaces and all the things, you've also been speaking a lot more. Um, what have you noticed in terms of, especially as we are in this new normal, what are some of the things that you have noticed among, you know, women really navigating this thing? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, the, the message I've been given is that this is a blank sheet of paper, new day opportunity for us. Nobody has lived on the other side, Felicia, of a, of a global pandemic. So guess what? Nobody has the playbook. So I still see people... Uh, you know, wandering around a little bit with, you know, how do I play this? What do I do? Struggling with whether or not they should go back. And so I've been saying, no, 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 don't think about going back. No, no, no. Don't wait for somebody to tell you what to do because nobody has the playbook. So why shouldn't your voice be the one that prevails? Create it oh. yourself. Oh, I love that. I love that because I know even me personally, sometimes we can get so stuck you know, become the bottleneck to our own success, you know, and we so we get so busy looking to the left and looking to the right instead of focusing on what, you know, what we've been put here to do. So I love that that's really like a key point of your inspiration for people to say, this is the time. This is the time for you to do that thing that you've been dreaming of all the time. Or don't now, hold back I, your voice in, yeah, in your environment. And that you asked me, what do I see women still doing and and what i'm seeing is still the hesitation right mm. waiting for the the permission right and nobody has the what i'm trying to say is that nobody has the power or the ability to give you the permission and yeah. sometimes you empower people because you ask for permission and you oh. know i'm a big fan of you know ask for forgiveness you know don't ask for permission come Go on now if you know what you need to do go for it even if you don't know what to do and you want to try it go for it because half the time you're following someone who's just trying it themselves mm -hmm. yeah you know we were just on a conversation this morning i actually said the exact same thing like this is the time to ask for forgiveness right because listen as long as you wait for someone to give you permission you'll always be waiting yep. and so i just want to were you going to say something there carla no no, no. yeah okay I just want to, to mention for you all, just so you know, because of this, this uh, extraordinary conversation that we're having with Carla, Take the Lead has created an absolutely amazing special for those of you who are considering coming to the, the Power Up uh, Big Week Conference on, uh, in August. Um, we're actually rolling back the super early bird prices for the next 24 hours. And so if you've been on the fence, if you've been thinking, waiting, holding out, this is the time to go to thepowerupconference.com and grab your ticket. And so, Carla, I want to I wanna just jump into to this a little bit because, you know, there's this thing around modern motherhood. And I know that you, you, you're a mother, and I just want to understand how you are navigating things um, from a modern motherhood perspective while also continuing continue to do your great work. Yeah, I have to tell you, Felicia, I am very proud of the fact that I'm walking my talk because when I did not have kids and women would ask me questions about how do you how do you manage through, you know, I would always say, make sure that you are constructing your own report card because I ran into so many women who felt like I wasn't, I'm not being a great mother. I'm not being a great partner. You know, will I have to compromise my career? And I said, no, the key is first of all, 
to understand what success looks like for you. Don't evaluate your life against somebody else's report card. And so mm. often society is saying women should do this in the household or a mom ought to do that. What works in your household is the report card. That's the first thing. The second thing is make sure you get people that can help you, right? There is no shame in that game. Everybody needs help on everything that they're doing at some point in their lives. Mm. And if there's somebody in your in your world, whether it's a relative or somebody that you hire that can be helpful to uh, for you and all the different things that you're trying to get accomplished in your household or all the things that you're trying to get accomplished as a mom, let them help you, especially if you have the resources to be able to do that. Do what is most important for you in your household. And now that I am a mother, I am definitely constructing myself in that way. As you know, Felicia, I have young children. I have a seven-year-old and a mighty two-year-old. Yes, a two-year-old. And, and I'll tell you, these ladies have taught me a whole lot about Carla Harris that I thought I knew that the boys on Wall Street had already taught me. But there's been a whole new awakening of an even different facet. And I am managing the process very much in the same way that is consistent with the advice that I gave. I have a great team of people who help me, whether they could be from my personal girlfriend village or they could be someone that I've hired as a babysitter. My husband is extraordinarily helpful. But again, I manage the process in exactly the same way. And there are some things that are sitting on mommy's plate that Carla Harris, the investment banker, manages it that way in the way that mm. I think through things. Go first for the solution, make sure that I'm maximizing all resources. And then there are other things where there's the investment banker is not there at all. It's just, you know, the woman or it's the empathetic ear or it's somebody who wants to be silly. But I fully own authentically all those parts of Carla and yes. deploy them as needed, even as mommy. Yes, I love that. It almost reminds me, you know, cause I had a, a huge medical scare many, many years ago. And I, as I was getting back into doing what I love to do, that was the exact question I had to say to myself because before the scare, my full identity was tied to being an HR executive in corporate. And so I had to say, okay, Felicia, what does success look like for you now? And be okay with that, right? Share the people who are doing some things that they're doing the way that they do it, but this is the way that Felicia has to do it today, right? That's right. And I love that. I love that. So just, you know, when you think about your seven-year-old, are there some things that you're seeing, you know, that, that, that they're seeing you do that you're seeing, like be, be mimicked within them? Yeah, I'll tell you, the, the big message that I'm trying to instill in my seven-year-old now is learning how to hear her own voice. Mm. Because as you go through school, especially for young girls, they get so many messages that we don't even realize are out there. You know, I'll never forget hearing Gina Davis speak at a Simmons conference and she was talking about the, you know, the subliminal messages that are sent through cartoons. The fact that in a crowd you only see one or two female characters in a crowd of 8 to 12, what message is that sending? The fact that on these five uh, very popular cartoons, you see no female protagonist. And I have to tell you, Felicia, I had never thought about that. And I've been looking at cartoons for a long time. Yeah, but, right. but when she said it all of a sudden, it made me think, well, as I sat in that audience, what, and at that time, my daughter was two. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. what channel is she watching? What do mm -hmm. I have her looking at? You know, mm -hmm. what's the male female ratio? What are the lines that the female characters are saying? So again, there's so many messages that they get. And now is the time, it used to be, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, but at six and seven, mm -hmm. they're picking up cues now from their friends and deciding that what this one's doing might be more important than what I think. So yeah. I've been really focusing in first grade on having her hear her voice, because the problem is when you get to be a senior in college, if you don't know how to find your voice mm -hmm. and hear your voice, that's not so great time to be led by other people because then it has real consequences. So you got to oh, know how to find your voice. That's so good. That's so good. And so speaking of finding your voice, when you think about over the course of your career, at what point would you say that you realize, yes, this, this is where I'm placing my vocal stake in the ground? At yes. what point was that for you? 
Yes, I would say I was probably five or six years into my career. And Felicia, you've heard me tell the tough story before. In fact, I told it at the first Take the Lead gathering. And that was, at, that was the time that I realized not only did I need to make sure that I was asserting my voice, but that was also when I realized I had the power to control how people see me. And you know, mm. that fourth pearl in that first book is perception is the co-pilot to reality. How yes. people perceive you will directly impact how they deal with you. But you, um, you need to understand, you can train people to think about you in the way that you want them to think about you by being intentional around those three words you want them to use when you're not in the room. Mm -hmm. Because as I always say, all of the important decisions about your career are made when you're not in the room. Compensation, promotion, new opportunities, all in a room behind closed doors where you are not present. So when people start talking about you behind those closed doors, what do you want them to say? You have the power to control that by your behavior. So all that came together for me in those first ahas around that fifth year mark. Okay. Oh, I love that. And in fact, that's actually the quote that I put in, in at the front of my book because that quote like really touched me so powerfully so to, to really help me understand that yes, I have complete agency to control how people perceive me, right? And so I love it. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hop to one of the questions. We had lots of questions that came through because I know that people are so excited about having the chance to hear from you. And so um, what would you say has been your biggest, your biggest personal learning as a result of the pandemic pause? Oh, it, it was sort of the, um, Reemphasization, or, or or the emphasizing, I should say, of your personal power, and that you had the ability to really create. And I'll tell you, Felicia, this has been one of the most productive periods in my life, and it's because I started the pandemic thinking that we would only be out of the office for two weeks. Aha, uh -huh. right? And I said, yeah. two weeks. What can I do with two weeks at home? Well. I can reignite my wellness program because it's already, you know, March 13th and I've already fallen off the wagon here for my new year's resolution. So let me get back on top of that. Ooh, I can clean my office, which I've been trying to do for a year, not knowing that this would become the place that would be, you know, on camera internationally for the next two years. But I became very focused on what I wanted to get done and I executed. And then when it looked like two weeks was going to go into a month, I said, Oh, what can I do with a month? So I basically had this rolling list of goals that I wanted to get done and also had some wonderful surprises. So in the middle of the pandemic, not only was I able to get myself in shape, but I was able to straighten up some things in my, in my place of living. You know, I adopted mm -hmm. another baby, five weeks old. That's why I have a two-year-old now, wrote a book, released an album, did two virtual concerts that won mm. awards, you know, because it was the intentionality that you own this time. I could not, mm -hmm. I could not control what was going to happen in the pandemic. I could control my actions to try to keep myself safe from a health perspective, but didn't know when a vaccine was going to come, didn't know how it was going to be distributed, didn't know how bad the pandemic was really going to get, didn't know if we were going to have real shortages around food and other items. So there was so much that was significant that I couldn't control, but there was a whole lot that I could. So yeah. again, it was being reminded and emphasize, emphasizing that which you can control and put your foot on the gas. Yes, I love it, I love it. And so when you, um, I would love for you to share the story because uh, a lot of people may not know that you are an amazing vocalist. And so I would love for you to share the story around how you actually started bringing your whole self into corporate spaces because you were kind of holding back on that at first. So That's I'd love exactly you to right. share that story. Sure. Well, coming out of Harvard Business School and I went straight into M&A and that was the late 80s. So those 100 hour weeks were fact, not fiction. And people would say, don't let them know you do anything else. You got to stay focused because they won't take you seriously as a banker if they know you do anything else. So in the beginning, you know, I kept Carla the singer way on the down low, you know, but little by little, somebody would have a birthday and I would sing happy birthday in the audience, you know, and for everybody, that was that Scooby moment. Hmm? Wait, <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Right. And, um, 
you know, so it started with a happy birthday here. Then it started with singing at the Christmas party. And then, of course, colleagues would tell clients that I could sing. And so they were singing at somebody's closing dinner. You know, so again, one thing led to another. And then I started realizing that it was the, the differential, if you will, between me and other bankers, because my colleagues would go in and say, and if I say, please don't tell them I can sing, I'm, you know, I'm here to pitch today, not to sing. But right. then all of a sudden, lo and behold, the client has a real interest in music and the client admires the fact that I can sing. And then we have a 15 minute meeting about music and singing before we even start the pitch. And mm -hmm. the, the aha for me was that was the 15 minute meeting before the meeting. Yeah. So they yeah. heard me with a different ear. They saw me through a different lens because Carla Harris, the singer, was in the room with Carla Harris, the banker. So that's one of the reasons, Felicia, I'm so passionate about people bringing all of them into the environment because you don't know what it is about your person that's mm -hmm. going to allow somebody to connect with you in a proprietary way, in the way mm -hmm. that they could only connect with Felicia, in the way that they could only connect with Carla. You don't know what it's going to be. It could be blue braids. It could yeah. be the white glasses. It could yeah. be your infectious laugh. It could be any of that. But but suppressing any of that, which makes you feel good and proud, takes away your edge when you're yeah. trying to connect on a relationship basis. I love it. I love the fact that you say that's proprietary to you. You know what I mean? We've got to, we've got to own that thing. And so this, this brings to mind a good thought around you know, a lot of times we talk about as women, sometimes we have a hard time like tooting our own horn. And so mm. what advice would you give to the women who are really in that place where they're afraid to really pitch themselves and toot their own horn? Yes. If you are uncomfortable with the pronoun I, then get comfortable with the pronoun we. Mm. Because you, you don't have to go around and say, I did so-and-so. But here's the script. Oh, Felicia, I have just got to tell you, we had an amazing win today. I got to tell you what the team did. We did mm. blah, 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 blah. Client loved it. We knocked it out of the park. This is one, even if we don't get this business, I'm still proud of because we couldn't have done any better. I'm so mm. proud of what we did. Now, we, 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 you heard it all over my narrative, but who told yeah. the story? You, yes, yes, absolutely. And so I do want to talk about, I know you've got, you've had a couple of amazing books, but you've got another amazing book that's getting ready to come out. And so I want to talk a little bit about the book. Can you tell us a little bit about the book and what we can expect? Absolutely. It's called Lead to Win. And it gives the pearls, if you will, of how you become a powerful, impactful, influential leader in this environment. So it speaks to people who are already sitting in the C-suite and many people who are already sitting in the C-suite, frankly, did not deploy some of these pearls around authenticity and building trust and being intentional around diversity and inclusivity because they came in through a different era. And most of us who are sitting in C-suite positions now came up during the time of the what I'll call the my way or the highway type leadership context. And the joke I like to tell is if your boss said jump, your answer was supposed to be how high. You say jump mm -hmm. to a millennia now, they're going to say why. Right. Right, so right, it's right. A, right. It's a completely <laughs> different context. And here's the conundrum. Most people lead the way they were led. Right. Mm. So these are some pearls that say in the context that we're in now where millennials and Zers are the dominant population in the workforce, they demand as table stakes, transparency, inclusivity, and feedback. And in order for you to be that kind of leader that they will follow, they're going to have to trust you. So I talk about the pearls of um, authenticity because it's key in order to connect with people. I talk about building trust. I talk about being intentional around diversity, creating clarity, creating other leaders. So in the middle of the book, there's a core of you know, intentional leadership pearls. But around that, it talks about what do you do if you are an individual contributor and now you become a leader? What does that mm. journey look like? And yeah. then I talk about what you should think about now if you're the new leader. Either you got promoted on your own right or mm -hmm. somebody else had to leave the organization and now tag, you're it. I also speak to entrepreneurs who are now in that CEO position. You started mm -hmm. this great company, but uh-oh, it's not four of you anymore, it's 40. And then quickly yeah. it's 400 and then yeah. maybe 4,000. How do you choose a team? You've had no experience interviewing people. 
you yeah. know how to build a how to build this thing that your company is built around but choosing the right team is key especially as an entrepreneur because in the early days of your company's life a bad mm. hire can be catastrophic now mm. if a company mm. like mine has 70,000 employees and the bad hire you know it's unfortunate but it's not going to take it down right. but with 10 people it could take you down so yeah. I, I give them 15 different questions if you don't have a kitchen cabinet to help you interview here are the questions you ask and here's what you're looking for in the answer so it gives some of those pearls and tools as well but it really is how do you lead most effectively in this environment mm, i love it and so when will the book be officially released then uh, is there a place where, where people where you recommend people go to get the book? absolutely if the release date is september 13th but you can pre-order now on barnes and noble on amazon you can go to your local bookstore which i'm a huge fan of going to your local bookstore and pre-order as well all right nice and we're going to be having some promotions by the way felicia so you know stay connected to the instagram the TikTok, uh because we're going to have a few promotions for signed books and a half oh. hour with me on career coaching Oh, I love it. Well, listen, I'm definitely going to be tuned into that. Let me tell you. And you know, the thing that's so amazing about the book is that it, it, it is in, a, in di direct alignment to the theme of Take the Lead's Power Up Conference. The theme is around the big re, rethink, rewire, recreate. And of course, we are so excited to be honoring you, Carla, at the conference uh, with, with the award. We're just excited about that. And so I just want to remind folks to not only go pre-order the book, right, but also stay connected with Carla on all the social spaces. And if you're still on the fence about attending the conference, today is the day to do it because we roll back the prices to the super early bird price for 24 hours at thepowerupconference.com. So yes, I'm so excited about that. And so let me let me tap into some more questions that we got from the audience. And so uh, someone wanted to know, um, what challenges have you faced as a woman of color in an industry that is primarily comprised of white men, especially mm -hmm. in your earlier days and how you overcame those challenges? Yeah, the big challenge was not knowing some of the things that I wrote about and expect to win. Okay. Right. And that was understanding that I had the power to control how people thought about me. That was understanding that I needed a sponsor. It wasn't about a mentor, but it was understanding that somebody had to be in the room uh, and use their currency on my behalf. And that's why I coined the word sponsor back in, you know, 1990 was the first time I used it in public to say, hey, you know, what you really need is a sponsor. And this is what a sponsor looks like. So not knowing some of those things, Felicia, was my biggest challenge at the end of the day if i had known some of those pearls when i walked in wouldn't have bothered me at all i've never thought that being a woman or being a woman of color was a liability in that kind of environment as the person described it because in fact i think it's an asset so if you are surrounded by white men and you're the only woman or you're the only woman of color then you don't have to vie for attention everybody sees you right and everybody's waiting whether they look like they're waiting or not everybody's waiting to see what you have to say and all you have to do is is to deliver your excellence right into that gap. Mm -hmm. And what were some of the, the, the key strategy, strategies that you used to actually build powerful relationships during that time? Mm -hmm. Yes, once I realized that those relationships were going to be key, I had to be intentional about it because it wasn't just natural for me. I'm not just Miss Social Butterfly. I am Miss Executor. So if I have things to do, I will yeah. always choose executing over schmoozing, right? Yeah. At least that's how I looked at it. So I had to be intentional and say, okay, it's Monday. Make sure you go by Bob's office. Make sure you go by Don's office and ask how was the weekend. All right, it's Thursday. Then now you need to go by Lily's office and you need to go check in with Michael. But I had to be, be intentional about that. And here's what I learned, that building relationships in your corporate environment is so much easier than even in your personal life because it takes very light touches, just yeah. small interactions with people and they think they know you. So you really haven't spent an hour or 45 minutes with them. It's been five over here, 10 over there, 15 minutes. But being frequent about it is what creates a relationship. And again, you get to control each of those interactions. So there's a consistent experience every time somebody's in front of you. Yeah, that's really good because oftentimes we feel like, oh my goodness, that's going to take so much time. It's going to take so much energy. I don't have time to do all that. But Not I love at all. that you have punctuated the fact that it just takes tiny little drips consistent yep. tiny drips that's the important thing yep that's awesome. exactly right 
And so we've seen more girls emerge as leaders in the past several years. What can we do now to develop and inspire more girls globally to become leaders? I think being visible and talking to those girls and talking with excitement about what you're doing, there's nothing more infectious than somebody standing in front of you showing that and demonstrating that they love what they're doing and that they're excited about it. That is infectious. And the more you do it with younger girls and younger professionals, the more impactful you'll be because they're at a stage in their life where they're not clear. And just mm -hmm. think about it, Felicia. When you went to college as a freshman or a sophomore, if somebody mm -hmm. said, what do you want to do, Felicia? You probably had an answer for them. But I would humbly submit to you that that answer was impacted or I would say influenced by whatever your parents told you as you were growing up. You yeah. ought to be an X or yeah. you ought to be a Y. Because I can remember saying to people, I want to be a lawyer. And at that time, I hadn't been exposed to anybody in my personal life at all who was in law. I, I hadn't even, I don't even think I'd even met a lawyer, but I grew up with people saying, you like to argue your point. You know, you, you really are very organized. You're very smart. You should be a lawyer. So you had asked me at 17, 18, 19, you know, what I was going to do. I said, I'm going to be a lawyer. And it wasn't until my sophomore year in college, 19, when I was exposed to Wall Street for the first time. And that turned my head because all of a sudden I realized there were a lot of things that I thought were found in the law that were actually found in business. And the things that I thought I wanted in a career in the law were actually found in business. And that's where I made the pivot. So the more each of us, no matter what you do, can talk to younger women about what you do, why you made the decision, what you like, what you don't like, it helps to inform them and helps them to clarify what they might wanna do. Mm, nice, nice, nice. Now, I love this next question that comes in. Uh, they say, you're an expert in finance. I worry that with inflation and a possible recession, it is not a good time to start my business. And this is good because we're definitely going to have an entrepreneurship panel at the conference. And so what do you think and should I be nervous about doing this? Okay, I'm not trying to be glib about this at all, but I mean what I'm about to say. As they say in Vegas, scared money can't win. Oh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And if, if you have a great business plan, now is absolutely a good time to start your business. Why? There are lots of people that are looking for opportunities. So this is a good time. And there are a lot of people that have an entrepreneurial appetite, especially millennials and Zers, even more than boomers and Xers. So even mm -hmm. though people are talking about a tight labor market, when you're doing a startup, there are not that many kind of opportunities where people can get in on the ground floor and really help try to build something. So yeah. now you may not be able to offer them salary, but you're offering them an experience that they're interested in. That's number one. Number two, mm -hmm. because we're in a tough, or if we go into a tougher market environment, you may be able to pick off talent from some of the incumbents that are already in the market that might be struggling. Because mm -hmm. whenever we're in these kind of economies, people get a little bit nervous. So mm -hmm. your startup or your new opportunity may be more attractive to that person that really hasn't moved at the company that looks like yours. Number mm -hmm. three, if you have a great business plan, please know that there's still a lot of money out there that's looking for new opportunities. And that if part. you can <laughs> see your way for your pipeline of business and you know there's a demand for what you have because nobody else is offering it in the market or you're offering it differently, you should absolutely go out there now. There have been lots of people who tell stories about, oh, I started my business during the financial services crisis, not mm -hmm. a great time, and it's a billion dollar business today, yeah. right? Or I started my business right in January 2020, oh, pandemic hit, billion dollar right. business today. Right. Right. Yeah. So I would yeah. say that good business plan, solid market demand, you can see it. You have enough people to help you prosecute the opportunity because that's where a lot of emerging businesses fall down. They don't hire up fast enough. They're mm -hmm. waiting for the sales to materialize before they actually spend the money to hire the people. But when the sales come, it comes hard and fast and you can't get enough people fast yeah. enough. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. You know, I always tell people, you know, through chaos, there comes opportunity. There's so much opportunity when we have a chaotic environment because if you really, really just take the time to really focus on what are the gaps in the midst of this chaos that I can really lean into and be the solution to that problem. That's and the so title to chapter seven and expect to win. Chaos breeds opportunity. Oh my goodness, so wonderful. Oh my goodness, so good, so good, so good. And so... Um, as you are um, 
as you are as you think about your Wall Street experience, how do you feel attitudes towards women and black women in particular have changed over the years? Yes, I absolutely think it's a much better environment because I think that a lot of the stereotypes and frankly, you know, ignorance that people might have had because they didn't interact with a lot of people that were women or that were women of color or that were black women. You know, now we've had, you know, 30 years of experience where there have been more that have been on the street. And I'm not in any way, Felicia, trying to say that is perfect, but I don't think that there's the the level of inexperience, if you will, that there was in dealing with somebody like me, there wasn't a level of, it's not that level of inexperience that it was in 1987. So Mm -hmm. I absolutely do think things have changed, number one. Number two, I could name every senior woman of color on the street in 1987, on the street, not at the manager Mm -hmm. director level, not Mm -hmm. at starting with me, every Mm -hmm. one of them. I cannot Mm -hmm. do that today. So Mm -hmm. that by definition, that means that that things are better. Again, it far, far from perfect, but progress has happened. Yeah, yeah. And so I have a couple more questions, but before I dive into those, I want to, Christina, just check in to make sure if, if there are any other questions that people have, this is a time to type a few of them in the chat and, and so we can get those answered. But um, Yeah, because we're I'll, really tight on time. I, I'm looking really at it now. We're here. Absolutely. So um, what would you say, especially to Black women, you know, when you talk about diversity and inclusion and all those things that we've been up against and where they have a little bit of, 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 of resistance around really knowing that there are people who are, who, are, who are our allies. What would you say to those women who are still resisting and having an open, open up space for trust to build those relationships? Yeah, thanks so much for that question because I do think um, you know, the, the trust issue is a big issue for us. Um, I think people of color in general and certainly for black women, but I, I encourage people not to subscribe every negative experience that they have had to the next person that looks like the last person that gave them that negative experience. Be very careful about that because I do think we're in an environment now where people are seeking information, they're seeking understanding, they're mm-hmm. seeking engagements because you know the report card of CEOs and leaders going forward very much will have on it how you engage with people, how you motivate and inspire diverse teams. That, that was not a part of a CEO's report card 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, but it will be going forward because mm-hmm. being able to retain the best people will be paramount to being able to prosecute any kind of corporate strategy. Mm-hmm. And we all know that talent is evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. So people mm-hmm. will be watching your stakeholders, your shareholders, your consumers, your prospective employees will be watching whether or not people really do have equal opportunity and equal access. So Mm -hmm. I I say to women of color now, this is not the time to be weary. This is not the time to be angry. This is the time to share information and give direction because Mm -hmm. more than ever, people are seeking it more than ever than I've seen it in my career. So, Mm -hmm. you know, so give it. People ask me all the time, aren't you tired? I'm like, oh, no, because yeah. I want to make sure people get it right. So if you're asking, I got an answer. Right, right. Yeah, I love that. And so as we close out, one final question, what would you say to the woman who is sitting on the sidelines, considering joining us at the conference, who's just kind of buffering, not it, it's kind of sucking in decision? What would you say to her? I'd say invest in yourself and go to that conference. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Carla. This has been amazing. This has been wonderful. And be sure to go uh, get the get get on Carla's list. Follow her on all the social media spaces. Pre-order the book thank you. because it's going to be amazing. And um, we love you. Thank you so much. And have thank a wonderful you. day. Well, all the best. I know the conference is going to be amazing. I can't wait. So go get them. All right. Thanks so much. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye.